Okay, hello everyone. It's time for us to get started. My name is Jessica and I'm an educator at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in downtown Dallas. And in just a minute, you're going to meet my friend Kristen, who's going to be teaching us about adaptation. She's gonna be asking a lot of questions like maybe what do you observe or what do you think about an animal? And we would love to hear your answers. So if you have the chat available to you, we'd love for you to type in your answers to the chat. And you can even ask your own questions if you wanna know something and we'll try to answer them. Or if you don't have the chat, we definitely still want you to be thinking about it. So you can say your answer to yourself. If you have a science journal or a scrap piece of paper, you can write it down. If there's someone else in the room with you, you can share your observations with them. So we definitely want this to be a conversation today. And with that, we are going to send it over to Kristen to get started. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking about animals and their adaptations that help them to survive in their habitat. So as Ms. Jessica said, this is gonna be a conversation. So my first question for y'all is, what does an animal need to survive? You want to type in the chat or you can share it with your neighbors or with your teacher or uh, think, it out, think it to yourself, whatever you need. I'll give you a few more seconds. What does an animal need to survive? If you thought about food, water, shelter, air to breathe, sunlight, those are all things that animals need to survive. And they can find those things within their habitat. And that's where they'll live. So these adaptations that they have are either physical things about their body or a behavior, an action, or something that an animal does that helps them to survive. Now, did anyone answer the question, what was your favorite animal? Owl, possum, snake, or frog? We're gonna be talking about all four of them today. And I think I'm going to start with my favorite, unless we had anyone in the chat. Did anyone respond? We had one owl, and owl's my favorite, too. Oh, well, then we'll start with the owl. Let me get this centered here. And the way this will work is I'm going to zoom into our animal, and I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to give you some time to make some observations. When you're making your observations, think about what you think the animal eats. Do you think that they are a carnivore, herbivore, or omnivore? Do you, how do they protect themselves? How do they get water? What kind of shelter do they normally find? How do they escape from predators if there are predators? Things like that. So I'll give you a moment and I'll keep an eye on the chat if you type anything there. But again, you have that option to think it. Uh, or write it in your science journal. One of the first things that I notice about the owl are its really big eyes. And if we look at, let me change the view really quick. If we look at its skull, we can actually see that the eyes are relatively large compared to the entire skull. It takes up a pretty good portion of it. So here's the side view of the skull. I guess I should do it this way, huh? That's better, huh? And here is the eye socket. It takes up a lot of space. There's two of them, of course. They have symmetry. That's the first thing I notice. Now, the eyes are so big. What, what do you think that would be good for? Do you think they have a good sense of sight? And if so, why would they need that good sense of sight? The next thing I'll mention while we still have this skull out while you're thinking about that sense of sight is its beak. We notice that the beak is kind of curved downwards and it kind of comes to a point. Now, that is good because owls are actually carnivores. And they're gonna use this beak to help tear or break meat and bones apart of an animal. And that's how they'll break it into smaller pieces so they can swallow it. All right, let me switch back. Let 
Owls are nocturnal. This means that they're awake at night and asleep during the day. And those eyes are really large because they allow extra light in at nighttime so the owl can see extremely well. And that's whenever it's hunting. So we said he's a carnivore. He might eat things like um, chipmunks and squirrels, maybe a frog, snake, small little animals like that. The next thing I notice are these little tufts of feathers on his head. And those are, I bet you probably think those are ears, but they're not. But I still want to talk about his sense of hearing. So our ears are on each side of our head. He does have two ears on the side of his head, but they're not in the same position as ours. And it does serve a purpose. So ours are about right here. Let me scoot down so you can see. But an owl's are actually asymmetrical, meaning that one ear is raised higher than the other. Can you think of a reason that would help an owl? This is almost like surround sound. So when an owl is hunting its prey at night, it actually sits on a branch, kind of like this one is posed now, and it listens and it uses its big eyes to look. And when it's listening, one ear will hear to the side and above, and the other ear will hear to the side and below. So you hear all around him, almost like a surround sound. So he has a great sense of hearing and he can hear those squirrels or chipmunks rustling on the ground and he can find out exactly where they are. Another thing that helps owls is if we look at the back. I'm gonna scoot this down a little bit. Look at the color of the feathers and then look at the branch. The colors of the feathers help the owl blend in during the day whenever other animals are awake and it is asleep. Do you remember the word for blending in with your environment? It's camouflage. This owl, the pattern of the feathers help it blend in with the trees, helping it uh, disguise itself while it's sleeping. Now owls, like other birds, do uh, take breaks in nests, but, but they don't make their own nests. Gray corn owls are opportunistic, which means that they don't take the time to build their own nests. What they do instead is they take advantage of a nest that's been left behind. And so their nests can be made of different things. Um, and that's just because they take advantage of that opportunity. It's more efficient for them instead of taking the time to build a nest to just use what's already there. Now this owl looks pretty large, but he, and the average size of a great horned owl is usually only about two and a half to three and a half pounds. They're very light. The feathers add to the lightness and their uh, hollow bones um, or have a really lightweight structure to them and it allows them to fly. And flying is great for a couple of things. They can avoid predators, they can move areas if it gets too hot or too dry or there's a lack of uh, food sources um, and it allows them to hunt. So as I said, they'll sit on those branches up high and then they'll just kind of swoop down and grab their prey with their talons. And if we look at their talons, we can see that those are kind of special too. There are three that point forward and one that points backwards. Can you think of an advantage that owls have using the three talons that point forward and one talon that points backwards? How could that help them? Well, if you notice my owl here, it's holding on to the branch. So the three point forward and one point back help it to hold on to those branches in the tree. But it's also great for hunting. Like we said, they're gonna swoop down and grab it with its talons. It's gonna use the three forward and the one back to grab it off the, the, the floor. Now, there is one thing that you cannot see my owl do because it's taxidermy, it doesn't move. But 
I want to ask you, do you think an owl can turn their head all the way around? Do you think they can turn their head all the way around? 360 degrees. So for some people, whenever they picture 360 degrees from an owl, they picture a full circle being able to turn their head all the way from one position all the way around. And some people think that if the head starts here, they can turn all the way around behind one way and all the way around behind one way. So it's kind of like uh, 180 degrees. But both of those are untrue. That's like a myth that owls can turn their head all the way around. What they actually do, so if this is our owl and facing forward, what they can actually do is turn their head 270 degrees which is about three fourths of a circle. So if I draw a circle here, it's about three fourths of the circle or 270 degrees. Oh, I forget that's backwards, 270 degrees. So not quite a full circle. Okay, Miss Jessica, did I miss anything on the owl? We talked about his sense of hearing, we talked about his sense of sight, we talked about how he flies, his movement. I did not talk about his breathing, but he actually has a pretty poor sense of smell. Um, and there's a joke that their favorite snack is actually a skunk because they can't smell how bad a skunk smells. So they don't care and they eat it anyway. I think you've covered everything from my favorite animal, the owl. What's your favorite animal, Kristen? Okay, so we'll do my favorite next. Keep in mind, if you have questions about the owl uh, and you put them in the chat, we'll come back to it and we can talk about it then. So the same question goes for my favorite, which is the frog. This is a bullfrog. And I'm gonna leave it here again. What do you observe about the frog? Thinking about what it eats how it might survive in its habitat. What, uh, how can it get away from predators? What predators does he have? So I'll give you some time for that. I think frogs are my favorite because of how their adaptations for eating are super cool. Um, so we'll talk about that first. Do you think that frogs are omnivores, herbivores, or carnivores? They're actually carnivores because they eat insects or more specifically, we can call them an insectivore. But that was also kind of a trick question because frogs go through metamorphosis, which means that their body looks different at different stages of their life cycle. And so as tadpoles, right after they're, they're, they start as eggs and then they hatch into tadpoles. And as tadpoles, they have gills that they can breathe underwater with, and they're actually herbivores and they eat the algae inside those ponds and streams that they're born in. And then as they grow older, they become frogs and they eat insects. So now if he's a carnivore. Now he has an adaptation to help him get food and uh, catch insects. And that is the long sticky tongue and sticky saliva. And that will help him to catch insects. But there's actually another thing that they do that is by far my favorite thing to talk about. And that's their eyeballs. And you're probably thinking, well, why are we talking about their eyeballs if we're talking about what they eat? Our eyeballs are fixed into the orbits of our skull. But frogs don't have uh, that palate in between their eyeballs and their mouth. So what happens is when they catch the prey and bring it into their mouth, they still need help swallowing the food and pushing it down their throat. So what they do is they use their eyeballs 
and they'll close the eyelids and push the eyeballs down into their mouths and that will push the food down their throat, which I think is super, super cool. Um, so it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Now, our frogs have nostrils right up here so they can breathe. You can see that. And they have a nice pointed nose, but they don't have any teeth, not really. Some frogs will ha might have a rope, but it's not normal and they can't really use them for anything. But the other thing that I noticed is our frog, he looks pretty lean and athletic in comparison to toads. So you can kind of see that they're, they're bony body structure here. And then the other thing is frogs camouflage with their environment. So that's how they might protect themselves. But the other way that they protect themselves is by hopping away. And we can see that they have these really powerful hips right here and then these long, long legs. And that's what's gonna help them jump or hop away from a predator. So very muscular legs. And the bullfrog is one of the largest true frogs in North America. And he can get up to 18 inches in length and weigh up to a pound. So he'd be pretty large for a frog. But they also have webbed feet to help them survive. Frogs and toads are considered amphibians, which means that they live part of their life in the water and part of their life out of the water. And frogs have this nice, smooth, moist skin because they absorb things through their skin. And so their skin is a very important organ for them. Now, if we look at a toad and make some comparisons between the frog and the toad, let me scoot them over. We can see our bullfrog. We said nice, lean, athletic structure to the body. The toad, isn't quite as lean and athletic. He's a little, uh, he's got a little bit more fat reserves on his body, which is okay. And then if we look at the legs, the legs of our frogs are very long, but the toad has shorter legs. So they can't hop or jump nearly as far as a frog can. They might hop or crawl or walk away, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna jump nearly as far as a frog. They also go through metamorphosis and uh, live part of their life in water and part of their life on land. But it, we can also see that the nose of our toad, it's kind of, it's wider. It's not nearly as pointed as a frog. The other thing we notice is although that to toads camouflage with their environment, their skin is a little bit thicker. They can be a little bit farther from a water source than a frog can. And they also have a really bumpy skin. So that's one noticeable difference. If you try to figure out if it's a frog or a toad, you can see the bumpy skin, it's most likely a toad. But some frogs can have bumpy skin too. Toads also release a poison from glands behind their eyes. And this poison, uh, if your dog picks it up, it might cause them to foam at the mouth, but the goal of the poison is just to get that animal to drop the toad and not eat it. We'll talk more about poison later, I think. Now, if we look really quickly at their skeleton, we can really see the difference between those legs. So here's our bullfrog, and we can see that they have those really, really long legs at the back. So you see those three bones and their feet. And then if we look at the toad, it's actually, much smaller. Their legs are not nearly as long. But we can also see that if we're looking at the mouth, they don't have that palate in between the eyeballs and the roof of the mouth. And that's what allows them to squish their eyeballs down. Nothing holding those guys in. The worldly muscles and tendons, of course, but nothing uh, solid keeping them in place. Okay. Uh, did I miss anything on the frog, Miss Jessica? No, I think I did. I don't think so. So just to wrap up, we talked about what he eats, and how it's a carnivore. We talked about protection using camouflage and jumping away to get away from its predators. We did not discuss what its predators could be, but dogs, coyotes, birds, owls, things like that could be a predator, possum raccoons, anything like that. Talked about how as a tadpole, it has gills. Now it has lungs. I'm trying to think. I don't think I forgot anything. 
Okay, if you have any questions about our frog or our toad, let me know. We'll uh, move on. So, I think I want to do the possum next. Is that okay? I don't see any questions. Can the owl's neck turn completely around? It cannot turn completely around, only 270 degrees. So they're missing a little bit at the back of their head. Let's do our possum. So by now, I think you know what I'm going to ask. What do you observe about our possum? And if you don't observe anything and you just know it, you can add that in there too. Again, thinking about where does he live? What, does they, what do they eat? Um, how do they protect themselves? I have an observation that he just has a really cute little face. <laughs> he, he really is super cute. We have a comment that it's missing fur on the tail. So you are right. Uh, this is a mammal, so it does have fur along its body. Um, and there is fur on the tail. So if we go to this view, I can show you. There is some fur on the tail, but it's not nearly as much as the rest of their body, but it does have fur on the tail. But they use their tail in a really interesting way. Um, they use their tail as a fifth limb. So two front paws, two back paws, and the tail as a fifth one. And they use it to help them climb up trees and to hold on to things. And we call it a prehensile tail, prehensile. And so when they're climbing, it will help them um, get up the tree a little bit faster um, and hold on and give them, just make it a little bit more sturdy for them. Um, some of you may know that possums can also hang upside down from the tree. And you're right, they do. Um, but it's only for a period of time, whenever they're juveniles, whenever they're young and they weigh a little bit less, their tails can support the weight of their bodies. But as they grow up and they get heavier, their tails can no longer support the full weight of their body. And so they cannot hang upside down from the trees um, as an adult. So if you do see one hanging upside down in a tree, that's why they're young. Now, the other thing that's pretty interesting about possums, I said they are a mammal and so they have fur, but more specifically, we can call a possum a marsupial. And that means that just like a mammal, they give live birth. So whenever babies are born, they're alive, but they're only about the size of a honeybee. And after they give birth, the babies have to make it into a pouch. And so possums have uh, pouches on their bellies and the the baby possums will stay in the pouch for about three months and then they'll move and hang on to the back of the mom. And then after, I think it's a few weeks, then they'll start to venture out on their own a little bit, but they'll still stay close. And whenever they get lost from their mom, they actually make cute little sneezy noises. And that's how the mom's able to find them. I hope I just added to the cute factor of a possum. I think you did. You're right, Joshua. The possum's tail can help them climb up in trees. Sorry if I'm late on that comment. I just saw it. Now, do we think that possums are herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores? So remember, herbivores are plant eaters, carnivores are meat eaters, and omnivores eat both. Let me switch views right here. We can look at the skull of a possum. So looking at their skull from the side, 
and the top, they have this nice crest here. This crest is actually going to help with muscle attachments for their jaws. Here are their cheekbones. Here's their snout and their nose. If you look at their teeth, they do have sharp canines, but they also have molars at the back. So this actually indicates that a possum is an omnivore. So he might use the canines if he's eating meat to tear it apart, but he's gonna chew a lot at the back using his molars. So he might eat nuts and seeds and berries. Um, if you have a garden, they might go after some of your vegetables, uh, trash even if you leave it out. Um, but they'll also eat things like insects, frogs, toads, uh, small rodents like mice. And possums, actually, they're nocturnal, which means that they're awake during the evening. And that's part of the reason why they've done so well in our urban environments, because we're asleep whenever he's awake. So they've kind of adapted to living in our areas as well, which is pretty cool to think about. Let's see. Oh, I forgot. Those are all physical behavior or physical characteristics about the possum that help it to survive, but we haven't talked about a behavioral adaptation that helps the possum to survive. And we call it playing possum. And what happens is it's, um, it's a response that they cannot control. Their brain triggers a response whenever they feel threatened or frightened. And what happens is their heart rate slows and their breathing slows so much that they assume uh, other animals will think that they are dead, and we call it playing possum. Um, it's very similar to our fear response. Whenever something scares us, we call it our fight or flight response. And we either, you might put your hands up to protect yourself, or you might scream, or you might run the other way, right? Um, we can't control it. It's just something that our body instinctively does. And it's the same with possums. It's something their body instinctively does to protect themselves. Let's see. So that's one form of protection. I know that whenever my dog has found a possum outside on our fence, uh, they also, they call it standing their ground. They'll stand their ground and bare their teeth and they kind of make a hissy noise towards my dog. My dog does not like it, um, but it gets my dog to leave him alone. So I guess it's all right, works for them. So that's another way of protecting themselves is to stand their ground and bare their teeth try to look more intimidating. I don't think that they would be good at using camouflage to protect themselves. Um, it really depends on what their, what their uh, background is in their environment, where they're living, as to how good the camouflage would be for a possum. But they do have a pretty good sense of smell and eyesight. Um, if you've ever seen them in your neighborhood in the evenings and in, at night, it's because, and you, you usually see their eyes glow, and that's because they have a special structure on the back of their eyes, and owls have it too. It's called a tapetum lucidum, and it reflects the light back and makes you think that their eyes are glowing. But it's helpful for animals that are nocturnal or who need to have night vision, kind of like our dogs and cats have it as well. Um, it Whenever light comes into the eye, it reflects back and then adds to it. So it's almost like the light hits the eye twice in a way, brings in more and allows them to have um, extra pre precision whenever they're viewing it at night. We do not have that structure in the back of our eyes, which is part of the reason we are not nocturnal animals. Um, so yeah, I think that's it for the possum. He's super cute. I. I love it. He's adorable. Um, I think that's it. I think. Okay. So we have time for one more animal, maybe two. We're going to do our snake next. So again, I'll zoom in on it. Think about what a snake eats. Uh, how do they protect themselves? Where do they live? How are, what physical features can you see that might help him to survive?
We have a couple observations. We have fangs. Joshua says that snakes are reptiles. Correct. Snakes are reptiles, and that means they're different from amphibians in a couple of ways. Uh, one of those ways is that reptiles have scales. We noticed that on our frog, they have that smooth, uh, almost like shiny skin because it's moist, right? It's kind of wet. Um, but snakes have scales and reptiles have scales. And then um, amphibians, whenever they lay their eggs, they're kind of like jelly-like. And reptiles have an extra uh, layer of protection. They can be farther from water, so they don't have to be as close as uh, amphibians. So there's a few differences. There's probably more. And yes, they do have fangs. And that's one of the first things I notice about uh, our snake is the fangs right here. I don't know if I can get any closer. See his fangs. Now, what I notice is there's two of them to begin with, but the other thing I notice is the shape of the fangs. They actually kind of look like this. They're curved backwards. Now, the other thing is they're retractable. So they'll kind of like fold back in whenever the snake's mouth is closed and come back out whenever they open their mouth in, the, in this manner. Um, rattlesnakes, this is a Western diamondback rattlesnake. They are venomous. And so venom will come out of those things whenever they do bite an animal or a human. And that venom uh, triggers a response from, uh, from their bodies. And eventually the animal, if it's small enough, will pass away. Um, snakes tend to eat things like little mice, little, little rodents again. Uh, they might eat small, small birds or lizards even. Um, Occasionally, if there's a frog around, they might go for a frog as well. But they are carnivores. And if we look at the skull, their fangs are actually, you see a lot inside the skull, but it's because they're replaced. So sometimes if a fang comes out or falls out, the snake will replace it with a new one. And those fangs are what the venom comes out of. So I said earlier that we would talk more about poison. And I want to mention the difference between poison and venom. They're both toxic. They can both harm humans and animals. But it's more about how that toxin gets into your body. So things like poison ivy, you get it from touching. And the toad secretes the poison that then you eat or a dog might eat if a dog picks them up in their mouth. And that is a poison. I think of it as, uh, if you think back about Snow White, Snow White gets a poison apple from the evil queen and Snow White is not poisoned and put to sleep until she eats the apple. So I think of poison and Snow White and the, the poison apple. Venom is actually injected into your body. And so when a snake bites you and pierces the skin and it injects the venom into your body, and that's the difference between poison and venom. So it's all about how it goes into the body. Okay, but they're both toxic and both harmful. So let me see. I just need to zoom back in. We had another Did interesting it? observation that some snakes have rattles like playing the cha-cha. I love that image. <laughs> yes. Yes, our, this snake does have a rattle. Um, it is, like I said, it's the Western Diamondback rattle snake. So he does have this rattle on his body. I was just going to talk about camouflage, but let's see. We can see the camouflage better from above. These scales, it's got almost a diamond back pattern, which is where the name comes from, but it helps them to camouflage with the rocks and the terrain that they're in. Um, earlier, I had a question about what these stripes are for and why it's a different pattern. And I tried to look it up in my, on my break, but I couldn't find it. Um, so that if you want to look up rattlesnakes and try and figure out why they have these stripes, go for it. Um, but as for the rattle, the rattle is actually made of the last little part of the snake's shed. And uh, humans shed their skin, um, but we do it. We, 
we do it differently than snakes do. Snakes actually shed their skin from head to tail all at the same time every once in a while. Even the, their eyelids. So they even shed over their eyelids. Um, so you can see this snake right here. And this is probably a, a ball python shed. We can see the top scales and the belly scales. They're a little bit different. Um, that aids in movement. You'll have this wave-like motion that comes through and pushes off the surface underneath them. And that's what allows them to move. But they shed their skin from head to tail every once in a while. And rattlesnakes use it and build their rattle. And there's a myth that you can tell how old the rattlesnake is by the number of lobes on their rattle. But that's not true because they don't just shed once a year. They shed every once in a while. And how often they shed is going to depend on many factors, how wet it is, how dry it is, the temperature, um, if they're growing or they need, you know, they need more scales or anything like that. Like all of those things are going to be factors. And then at the end, at the tip, some of them will be lost over time too. So can't tell how old a rattlesnake is by the rattle. Um, and yes, it is kind of like a cha-cha, right? It makes that, that noise. Um, but it goes up to, I think it's 60 times per second. So can you imagine using a maraca to make that noise 60 times per second? That's a lot. It's really fast. Now, I also know that rattlesnakes have a bad reputation. And I really want to point out that snakes, rattlesnakes aren't, they're not offensive. They're not looking to harm humans. What happens is that they have their personal bubble and we are probably walking on the path or, you know, off the path, right? Hiking and exploring. And they camouflage with their environment so well that we don't see them. And what they do with their rattle is you hear the rattle probably before you see the snake. But whenever you hear the rattle, it's almost like the snake is warning you. They're trying to say, excuse me, I'm here. Please don't step on me. Please, I feel threatened. You are much, much larger than I am. Please don't come any closer. And instead of us freaking out, what we should do is you should kind of pause, listen, try to figure out where the rattle is coming from, and then go in the other direction. The last thing you want to do is freak out and head towards the rattle unintentionally because they're already feeling threatened and they will bite you if they feel threatened. But if you walk away and leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. Um, earlier I had a question if a snake could chase if a snake would chase a human. And I don't think normally that they would. Um, again, they're not seeking humans for, for food or anything like that. Um, so it's almost like a waste of energy for them to chase after a human. So let's see. Oh, I mentioned the curved fangs, but it serves another purpose. Not only do they inject the venom, but it's also to keep food in their mouth. So if a rattlesnake has something in their mouth and it tries to wiggle out, it will get caught on those fangs and injected with venom again. So that's where it's, where it's nice that they have those curved teeth. We Let's have see. five more minutes. So I think we can learn about one more thing today. One more thing. Okay, so we talked about four animals. We talked about our great horned owl. We talked about the rattlesnake. We talked about the possum and we talked about a frog. But whenever you go out, into an environment or an ecosystem, you're not always going to see the animals every time you go out there or every animal that lives there. What you will find are some things that are left behind by the animals. So I wanna have a scat chat. So one of the most common things that animals leave behind for us to find in those environments and ecosystems is their scat. Does anyone know what scat is? Scat is just a fancy word for poop. So this is some scat that's been left behind by either an owl, a toad, or a frog, uh, a snake, or 
a possum. And I'm going to start with this one. So this is an animal that we said hung out in the trees and, you know, flew away. And uh, we didn't talk about owl pellets, but what happens with an owl pellet is that's all the, the bones and the fur and the stuff that an owl cannot digest. And what they do is they spit up the pellet, which is almost kind of like vomit. So that means that only the soft stuff is digested. And so their scat ends up being really liquidy. And so it ends up looking like this white stuff on the tree. So that's how you can tell an owl's been there. Next, let's see, let's do this one. This is scat from an animal that we talked about. So now we're down to possum, snake, and frog. What we can see in here is that this one has seeds in it. That's what all those little round things are. And this one, there is some fur inside of it. See it kind of coming out of the edges there? So this is from the only animal that we talked about that's an omnivore. So an omnivore eats plants and meat. And we can see that in this scat. So this scat belongs to our possum. All right, next. This one's pretty small. Let's see if I can get the angles right. What we see in this one, right here, that on the outside, those are actually insects and exoskeletons of insects. Do you remember what animal eats insects? This is from our frog or our toad. And this is more specifically from a toad. Um, and it's pretty large because they don't poop very often. So that's why it's so big. And that means our last scat comes from a snake. Snakes are carnivores, so you might see some fur in there. And then also, the first thing that I notice is that you have this white or off-white colored portion, and then you have the darker portion. So snakes, uh, whenever they do use the restroom, they don't go very often, and whenever they do, they make sure to go number one and number two. They urinate and they poop at the exact same time. And since they don't urinate very often, it's concentrated. And so all of this white stuff that's in here is the urine, and the brown stuff is the poop. So that was our scat chat. If you have any questions, I think we might have a minute or two longer, I don't know, for questions. So if you wanna add those to the chat, you can. If not, I wanna say I had a lot of fun talking about some of my favorite animals. And I hope that whenever you're out exploring your neighborhood, your schoolyard, your, even if you're just at a walk in the park, um, look for some of the signs that animals leave behind, like tracks and scat. And then think about, how an animal is adapted to survive in that environment. And is it a physical adaptation or a behavioral adaptation? All right, Miss Jessica, do we have any questions I didn't answer? I don't think so, but thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today. Of course, thank you for having me. I was so happy to do it.